I want to share this animation with you because some of you may not have ever seen a baby being born. So this is just an animation and I'll tell you why I want you to watch it after we watch it. So here's a baby's head crowning and notice that the baby is facing down, right? When the head comes out, let's watch that again. This is one of my favorites. So let's just take a quick peek again. The baby's head is coming out. The head, the face is facing down. And why is that? That's not an accident. That is because that moment when you were born, if you were fortunate enough to be born vaginally, is really probably the most important part of your life. It's not your first day at school or the day you get married or your first day of medical school or your day-to-day -day joining us for the real truth about health. It's actually that moment because as a baby's head turns posteriorly to face what we call the perineum, which is that area of real estate between the anus and the vagina, the baby's head turns like that so it can swallow a mouthful of microbes. So it can become colonized with the mother's founding species, with the mother's bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, et cetera. And babies who don't have the good fortune of being born vaginally are colonized with hospital acquired staph, which is as bad as it sounds. So when we look at the differences between babies being born via C-section and being born vaginally, we see huge differences in allergies, in asthma, in autoimmune diseases, in obesity, and even in susceptibility to viral infections. So C-section births increase the risk of all of this and vaginal births decrease it. And again, why is that? It's because you need those microbes, right? And if at birth, you don't get those founding species, it can follow you later into life. This difference um, is not just for birth, it also translates into breastfeeding. The third most common ingredient in breast milk is something called an HMO, human milk oligosaccharide. And human milk oligosaccharides are completely indigestible by babies. So why would the third most common ingredient in breast milk be something that a baby cannot digest. It's because it's not there to feed the baby. It's there to feed the baby's gut bacteria. And so the HMOs, the human milk oligosaccharides, feed the baby's burgeoning microbial army and make the microbes in the baby's gut and the baby itself more resistant to staph and other pathogens it may encounter on the mother's nipples. So again, it's this combination, it's this one-two punch, right? Of the baby being born vaginally, being colonized with all the important species, and then the human milk oligosaccharides continuing to feed those species. And you know, it's not just birth and nursing postpartum, it's what the mother eats during pregnancy too. So there's incredible data. There's a fascinating study from South America that shows that mothers who eat during pregnancy, a high sugar, very starchy, high, simple carb, you know, think a lot of baked goods and packaged goods and sodas and stuff like that. If you're eating that when you're pregnant, that can triple your baby's risk of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus <clears throat> after they're born. Now, RSV is one of the most common viruses, and most children have had it by the time they're two or three, upwards of 90% of them. But what eating that starchy, sugary diet can do is it can increase the likelihood that your baby's RSV is going to be a severe form of RSV and not just a simple cough or cold, that your baby may actually end up with pneumonia. So it's a really one, two, <clears throat> it's a one, two, three punch, not a one, two punch, because it's what the mother is eating while she's pregnant that is informing what's going on in her microbiome that's going to be transferred to the baby. And then of course the nursing. So, you know, these, I remember when I was in medical school at Columbia and I was doing my pediatrics rotation and there was a sign in baby's hospital. That was what it was called from La Leche, which is an international organization with the goal of promoting breastfeeding in women. And there was, a, there was a sign in the clinic saying how not breastfeeding your baby increased the risk of autoimmune diseases like Crohn's. And I remember thinking as a third year medical student, just scratching my head and going like, huh, H how can that be? Like, that doesn't really make sense to me that not breastfeeding could increase Crohn's. Like, what does breast milk have to do with something that's going on in the gut? So fast forward a couple of decades, 
And we know that is exactly right. La leche was spot on because if you don't have the right microbes and you have a disrupted microbiome, it increases the risk for all kinds of autoimmune diseases, including Crohn's. And that's something we're going to be talking about too. So let's, let's move on. What I want to show you here in this schematic is that there are four main families of gut bacteria, and you do not have to remember this, but the four main families are Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes, Proteobacteria, and Actinobacteria. And Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes make up upwards of 90% for most of us. And they're all represented, as you can see, by the different colors. So you see the Firmicutes in the kind of pale purple and the Bacteroidetes in the paler blue. Now, there's a big difference, as you'll see, between the microbiome of a baby and an elderly person and even a toddler. And you, what you'll see is that whether you're breastfed or formula fed, that changes the composition, antibiotic treatment changes the composition, malnutrition changes the composition, obesity changes the composition. And as we get a bit older, that changes it too. And, and really what we see here is that these disease states including gastric bypass surgery, any kind of bariatric surgery, metabolic disorders, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, et cetera, inflammation and cancer, they're all associated with changes in the microbiome. And what is represented here in that little pizza pie slice is proteobacteria. And it's an overrepresentation of proteobacteria in these conditions. Now it's not just proteobacteria. I don't want you to think like, oh, proteobacteria bad, bifidobacteria good. It's definitely more complex, but this is just a schematic showing you that that is one of the things that happens in addition to the fact that we go from high to low diversity. Diversity in the microbiome is key. Just like we need diversity in the world to have a healthy world, we need diversity in the microbiome. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about this concept of good and bad bacterial flora. You know, I like to ask people sometimes when I'm giving a talk live, I'll say all the good people in the room, raise your right hand and all the bad people raise your left hand. So I usually have two hands raised because sometimes I'm very good and sometimes I'm not so good. Sometimes I'm a little bad. So we all have this potential to be good versus bad, most of us. And the same with gut bacteria. And so we're going to talk about this concept of balance and pathobionts in just a moment, but let's start with some prototypic good bacteria. So those are things like lactobacilli, certain forms of E. coli, but again, E. coli, some of you may know about E. coli 0157H7 that's associated with a very severe illness called hemolytic uremic syndrome. And E. coli 0157H7, that's a subtype, is associated with foodborne illnesses, contaminated meat usually. And it can cause this very severe diarrhea and hemolytic uremic syndrome where there's bleeding in the GI tract and there's also involvement of the kidneys. So that's an example of an E. coli that's not so good, particularly when it's disproportionately represented. But bifido, lactobacillus, E. coli, generally the good. Clostridial species can be both good or bad, but one particular kind of clostridium called clostridium difficile, we affectionately or rather unaffectionately call it C. diff in the hospital. It's responsible for hospital acquired antibiotic associated diarrhea that kills about 20,000 people in the US every year. Enterococcus fecalis, that's another bad one. And that one I'm going to circle back to, to talk about with COVID because high levels have been found to be associated with poor outcomes in COVID. And there are other ones, Lampylobacter too. So this is just a sprinkling, but really this is what I want to show you what happens. So it's less about memorizing, oh, proteo bad or clostridium bad and uh, lactobacillus good. It's more about understanding this concept of microbial balance. So in this slide, what I have represented here at the top is really just sort of a normal gut, right? And with a normal gut generally has anaerobic microbes in it. So microbes that basically their metabolism doesn't involve a lot of oxygen. Unlike the lungs, which are getting a lot of oxygen, the gut is typically not getting a lot of oxygen. So the first thing that happens, for example, if you take one of those broad spectrum antibiotics that I was talking about that are, are given in the hospital frequently, uh, a seven to 10 day course of one of those antibiotics can remove up to a third of your gut bacteria. And 
the, if you think that you just take a probiotic and then you're good, that is really magical thinking. That is not how it works at all. Many of these species are never coming back depending on what age, whether you're young, where your microbiome is more tender and you can do more damage versus you're older and you have more resilience. But to get back to this idea of microbial imbalance, so you, first thing that happens is you have a reduction in the amount of normal anaerobic microflora. Now this can happen because of antibiotics in one fell swoop. This can happen because you're eating the standard American diet, uh, low fiber, lots of meat, sugar, fat, et cetera. The second stage is that you see an even greater decrease in the amount of normal anaerobic microflora, and you start to see colonization with some of the more pathogenic microflora. Now, not pathogens like Ebola or SARS-CoV-2 virus or, you know, cholera, pathogens in the sense of bacteria that are normally present in lower levels, like the clostridial species. Most of us actually have clostridial species and up to 10% of us have C. diff in our gut, but at low levels and at low levels, C. diff is not a problem. It's when you kill off a lot of the healthy bacteria and now the C. diff are like, oh, we've got room, let's multiply. Same thing for yeast infection. We all have yeast in our digestive tract and vaginally, and yeast actually play an important role in digestion. But when you kill off healthy bacteria, now the yeast, again, they multiply, they overgrow, and now you have yeast overgrowth. But the problem when you think about it isn't the yeast. The problem is the lack of healthy gut species. So what happens here in the third stage is you see an even more significant decrease in the amount of healthy anaerobes. And now you start to see not just colonization, but active reproduction of some of these aerobes and the fungal organisms. And then in the final stage with severe microbial imbalance, you see a dramatic decrease in the bifido and the lactic acid bacteria. You can barely see, you know, you see just two tiny little representations and now active reproduction of these aerobes and fungal mycoflora. But if you approach this as, you know, within this sort of scorched earth approach, like I'm going to get in there and I'm going to kill all these bad bugs. What will happen is you end up also depleting your few little uh, helpful lactobacillus and bifidobacteria that are there. So the goal should always be, I mean, unless you're dealing with really a life-threatening serious infection, the goal always has to include repopulation, not just eradication, and sometimes not even eradication, but repopulation. Mm -hmm. 